1980, as a political prisoner in the Maryland Penitentiary, I and a number of other prisoners, along with the librarian, uh, organized a program called To Say Their Own Words. At this program, we had a number of speakers, Amir Baraka, Askia Muhammad, Bruce Franklin, and Charlie Cobb are some of our most prominent speakers. When educational programs were more standard in prisons, these thinkers and scholars came in and spoke about topics like impending US fascism, the prison industrial complex, capitalism, increasing surveillance, and many issues that have escalated today. We were able to find some of these people that spoke to us. We are talking to them now about what's happening in America today and about a number of their predictions that have came to pass. The 13th Amendment, the one that says that slavery don't exist in America except in prisons, you know. And of course, we know that we are not slaves. We don't have any desire to be slaves. Racism is the foundation of the entire system. Racism is the foundation of capitalism. Racism is the foundation of imperialism. I think whether we look at it historically or whether we look at it in terms of the kind of politics that's going on in the world today, I think we'd still come out with the same answer. What I'm talking about is from a slave to a convict, from a convict to a prisoner, from a prisoner to an inmate, from an inmate to a resident. Patient education and persuasion by those of us who think that we advanced. That is the responsibility of consciousness. Consciousness carries with it responsibility. Let me greet you as Muslims ordinarily greet uh, one another, and in a sense, in a way that people have greeted one another for centuries with a greeting of peace, which is Assalamu Alaikum. This is our program. And this is the proof that it's our program because we do the work. Thank you for joining this episode of Rather Than the Bars, uh, Bruce. Well, Eddie, it's great to see you. It was 40 years ago when we last saw each other. Yes. Um, okay, so that, that leads me to the first question. 40 years later, how have things changed in your opinion? Last time we were meeting in the penitentiary, that was 1980, it was June. Uh, Reagan hadn't been elected yet. Mass incarceration had started. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. But we had no idea where it was going. So in, in the next 15 years, the number of Americans prisoned tripled. By the same time, not that we're talking about 1945, uh, by that time, for the first time, at least since post reconstruction, there were more black prisoners in prison than white prisoners. That people don't realize how much that had shifted. And you know, I, I looked at that footage when we talked forty years ago. And we're talking about surveillance cameras and things like that, but that was nothing compared to the society we're living in now. So I, I wanted, I wanted put a term into our conversation, which is fascism. So we, we talked back then about you know, Matt Malcolm's statement that for black people, America has always been a prison. So it's not, you could be out of prison, but you're still in prison. If, if you go to jail, so what? If you're black, you were born in jail. <laughs> If you black, you were born in jail. 
And that's true. And when we think about the concept of fascism, we don't apply that to colonialism, to slavery. And the reason we don't, you know, M. A. Césaire, the great uh, theoretician of imperialism, explained that when we do it to people of color, we don't call it fascism. So, we, so we, what's the what the European colonial powers did in Africa to Africans, we don't consider that fascism. But when wh white people are the victims of it, that's when we call it fascism. So that's so it's 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 the conditions of oppression, as super exploitation, when that becomes the norm for the whole society, that's fascism. Now, we, we look in that 40 years since we talk, a lot of the hallmarks of fascism have become true in the United States. The, the surveillance, the unleashing of the police, mass incarceration, and so forth. But we, right now, are right on the verge of having a true fascist society. And then we don't have that now, but our president has made it very clear that that's what he's offering. And something like 40, what, 44, 43%, something like that of the American people want that. So the election that's coming up is an election to decide whether we have what remains of democracy or whether we have a true fascist state. And if Trump wins the election and is able to replace Chief Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg with two people like Kavanaugh or worse, he can do anything because the Supreme Court tells us what our laws mean. They interpret the laws and they can, they can interpret the laws any way. We, we, we think about the 13th Amendment of the Constitution that Congress and the president passed in order to abolish slavery. That's what they thought they were doing. But that was used as soon as the federal troops were taken out of the South the 13th Amendment was used to criminalize all Black people in the South. You know, lawyering means staying in the same place, vagrancy means traveling around, looting, lascivious conduct, you know, all kinds of things. And so but the Black people of the South were largely put back in, into slavery on the basis of that one clause in the 13th Amendment, which is just that would put in there just because that was the, the norm was you, people get convicted of a crime and they're forced to do unpaid labor. This is a way to just criminalize a whole population. So th this is what we're facing if the Supreme Court is in the hands of a fascist ruler because of whatever he wants to do, we will have um, the suppression of vote, the, the, any laws, any, any, any presidential proclamation that the president issues will be law. And there's, there'll be no way to challenge that. There'll be no way really to fight back against that. You know, people think that under fascist rule, a, a revolution is possible. Where's the example of that? Um, I've done underground work. You cannot do underground work with modern surveillance that's in place right now. So that's what I see as issue in less than 60 days. Um, okay, you raised some, some interesting points. Um, one, and, and I know you clarified the, the whole fact that when this, uh, uh, totalitarian activity or extrajudicial activity is applied uh, to uh, uh, people of color or people that's been marginalized. 
it's not considered as fascism and but the the deal is that there's a tremendous amount of people in America that has always lived on the fascism continue to live on the fascism and now they're in open rebellion there's um uh, protests across America uh and I'm I'm not going to question the 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 numbers that you presented in terms of 43% of people want fascism uh and that might be true but I, I guess that also means that 60 uh what 57% don't want fascism <laughs> but is 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 there a possibility uh considering the rebellion that's going on the the pandemic that's going on, the economy in crisis, uh, now the uh, prison industrial complex in crisis. And is there a possibility of a civil war? Uh, because uh, in a lot of cases where fascism has pushed forward, uh, the pushback has led to civil war. Uh, is that a possibility? And that's not a possibility because uh quite frankly when you talk about the election in uh 60 days or something like that if it's that far away um uh, it looks like the outcome of the election election won't make a difference at all to uh trump in terms of whether he respected or not uh uh the supreme court gave bush uh the election after the florida uh fiasco uh uh, even if they don't give Trump this election, the possibility of him not recognizing it is real also. Uh, so where do we go? Is there a civil war on the horizon? Is there another way in which we can do this? Uh, give me some feedback on that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I mean, th these are dark times with the pandemic, with this president we have. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I'm 86 years old. I've been, you know, an activist for over six decades. But I've never seen a movement as wide and deep as the present movement. So this, this is hopeful. I mean, it's, it's, it's very exciting to, to see all these young people out there. So this is, this is a wonderful movement. Uh, and, it's, and it's very hopeful. But when we're talking about civil war, um, we have to say the fact that the guns right now are almost all on the other side. So we have the Department of Homeland Security, which Trump has used. We have the right wing militias uh, which are he's encouraged to use. He, he's actually praised the murder committed by a member of, of the armed militia. Uh, we don't know where this military would come down. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's a question. But when we think of real fascism, I, I see America today is very similar to Germany in 19. 33, when Hitler was just about to sort of win an election with about 40% about of the population and then was able to consolidate his power. But once he, could, once he re, um, released the, the storm troopers um, and instituted the reign of terror, it took the combined military might of the Soviet Union and the United States to overthrow the power that he had amassed. Um, and the president of the United States controls military forces um, you know, greater than anything that the planet has ever seen before. So I think that the idea of, of a civil war once fascism has been established, is a pipe dream. You know, that's that's my opinion. I I don't want to see us there. I, I just want to, I just want us to understand that we can defeat it because, as Eddie, as you were saying, 
it's still a majority of the American people who don't want fascism. And it's a, a majority of the American people who recognize Trump for what he is. I mean, there's no way that he can win a fair election. And there are organizations working hard now to make sure that we have something approaching a fair election. We have that, he's out. I'm, I'm not an, I don't have any illusions that uh, if Biden wins, all of a sudden, hey, way, hey, this wonderful democracy. No, we're going to be back to where we were. Um, Biden is something like Obama light. And then the other point that you uh, brought up, Peggy, was a very important point about the uh, Supreme Court giving the election to Bush in 2000. We have to remember um, that one of the corollaries of mass incarceration is the difference, is the taking away the vote of millions of people, uh, predominantly people of color. So in Florida, where the final tally was, well, I think it was 527 votes, um, there were 400,000 people who had been disenfranchised by felony disenfranchisement, and most of those people were black. So, um, and there have been there's several, two books written that if without felony disenfranchisement, the Democrats would consistently have a significant majority of the Senate. So felony disenfranchisement, this corollary of mass incarceration is a fact of American prison life, of American <laughs> political life, um, that we have to reckon with and we, ha we have to do something to reverse it. it it's interesting that in Florida, um, when we had that referendum, uh, I think it was close to three quarters of the people in Florida voted against felony disenfranchisement, but the Republican legislature then said, well, okay, uh, they can work vo vote as soon as they paid back the cost of their imprisonment, which was a way of um, reinstituting a poll tax, which is unconstitutional. But you know, we, when we say unconstitutional, we're going back to the uh, 15th Amendment, which you know, everyone, you know, males uh, was at that time um, had, had a right to vote. But the Supreme Court, in the late 19th century kept reinterpreting the 15th Amendment to make it the, op the opposite. Uh, and the president of the Supreme Court actually uh, overturned the Vo Voting Rights Act, which was the implementation of the 15th Amendment. So that's, that's what we're really dealing with. I mean, they can, they can take away the vote uh, through the Supreme Court, just by saying, well, that's what, here's what the words really mean. You know, um, I had been watching, and of course I've been watching this thing in Florida with the, uh, the uh, voting rights for uh, ex-prisoners, but I've noticed around the country, especially in Republican held states, they have been enacting all sorts of laws and legislation to remove people from the the voting list, they have tampered with and made uh, a mockery, uh, for the for the want of a better word, of the voting rights of people uh, people in uh, minorities, people in uh, uh, communities of color. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, they have like uh, hundreds of voting polls and stations in white communities and two in black communities, but the population might be 60, 40. Uh, and uh, so they've done all sorts of things already before this election occurs. And of course now with the post office in Trump's hands, uh, the, you know, there's, and everybody says there's gonna be a problem with the mail-in voting and because of the pandemic and so on. But the fact of the matter is, whether there's a problem or not, 
there is an appearance or or the big lie. You know, Hitler told that big lie. He told it so many times that people believed it. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm concerned. Yes, people should get out there and they should vote. That's no question. Whether it's whether it's going to count whether uh, it's already been corrupted, that's a whole nother question. But the question that we have to face is what happens on the morning after. One way or another, uh, you're right, we don't, we're not per se armed. It's in, in America's military is strongest, uh, next top 10 militaries in a row. I understand that. Uh, but capitalism is at a crisis point also in the world in terms of stealing resources, uh, disrupting civilizations and economies. Uh, all that seems to have some kind of in overall impact. And I know for a fact that that's part of what brings fascism into being, but it's also part of what makes a society collapse. Talk a little bit about the day after what are we looking at, no matter what? Well, you bring up so many important points, Eddie. Um, the fact is fascism uh, is a system that imposed when capitalism is in real serious trouble, and it is. I mean, capitalism is in trouble. Um, we, saw that, we saw that in 2008. Uh, we haven't got the escape from that. Uh, cap the capitalist mode of ownership and production is making uh, the existence of our species on the planet uh, questionable. Um, you know, <laughs> I I'm sitting here talking. I have to stay in the house because the, the I'm talking from California. Uh, we saw. So, uh, a sky that looked like Mars. Um, I can't. I, I can't go outside. The air is too uh, deadly outside. It's not too great inside. So the, I mean, so and, and so we have again. Uh, it's not just Trump. It's the Republicans, but they they are financed in part by the fossil fuel industry, um, which is destroying the planet. It's, if, you know, it's, it's not clear that our species, you know, Hobo, Homo sapiens is going to be a successful species. We've only been around a short time and we already, in the short time that we've been around, created two threats to the existence of our own species. You know, nuclear weapons, obviously, uh, nuclear war, that's the end of our civilization, but probably of our species. And, and now uh, climate change. Um, and we're witnessing that we're, here on the West Coast, we're witnessing, we have 85 fires burning uh, on, on, in Washington, Oregon, and California. Huge fires, we can't con contain them now uh, on the East Coast and they get, get Gulf Coast may be battered by tropical storms, the oceans rising and so forth. So that, that, that's, that's why the capitalists have decided, and it's not just in this country, this is a, a worldwide phenomenon that they have to you know, get power and not have this democratic form of government where what they want to do can be challenged by, by the people. Which gets to back to the question you're raising about the day after. Well, it's not going to be the day after because the day after we're not we're not going to know who, who won uh, because it's going to take a while to to count all those ballots. So yes, I mean at at that point, I think people do have to be ready to um, go into the streets um, to do everything we can to insist that the ballots be counted, that they be counted fairly and so forth. There, but there are things that, that's a little hypothetical when talking about the day after, where 50 some odd days before, 
and I, I mentioned before, there are several very good organizations working to um, make sure or to, to counteract the um, wiping people off the off the voters' rolls, to make sure that there are sufficient machines available uh, in in the neighborhoods where there are high democratic uh, registered votes um, to make sure there's a one called uh, recla reclaiming the, our vote uh, which is just instructing people in the screening space about how to register how to make sure they're registered properly um, and to make sure and to make sure that their vote is counted so there are a lot of things that people can do right now to um, make the election more or less a fair election. I say more or less because these forces on the other side are determined to make it not a fair election to make sure that they win. Um, after that, uh, we need to be prepared to do whatever we can. <laughs> The challenge if if they're if they're actually uh, and doing what they're trying to do, which is steal the election, and I I think I, I think to understand that it, you know part of it is capitalism is in trouble, but it's also to, you know you know any um, zero sum game. It's very helpful to understand your opponent's thinking. So you know what? Why do we? Why do we have so many Americans? You know, whatever the percentage is, who who love uh, Trump and and want to buy what he's selling. Well, you know, if you think back to the day of two thousand eight, economy is the whole financial system is near collapse, and then someone with a name of Barack Hussein Obama, a black man, wins overwhelmingly um, the president of the of the United States. So if you if you're a person who is a you know, white supremacist, um, doesn't want that kind of America, that was very scary, uh, very threatening. Um, then they look. They look around and look at the demographics of America, and look at look at the um, the Dreamers and Obama as, as president. Of course, um, passed the DACA, um, giving them a chance to not not get thrown out of the country and pass pass to citizens. So. The, they they're looking at the election you know from the other side they also understand that this is it because if they lose this election um their hope of this white supremacist america may be gone because of the demographics of 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 the country um so for, for them also, it's a it's a all win or all lose election, and that's why they're going to do whatever they can do to keep us from having a fair election and to keep Trump in power. And Trump, you know, he's he has had almost four years to broaden his base. He doesn't he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't really want to be just president. He wants to be somebody who is able to rule the way fascist rules rule, not not the way democratically elected presidents rule. That's that's where we are. I I I didn't think we would get here, you know, in the second decade of the twenty first century, but that's where we are. Considering the threat to the species uh, uh, of global warming, uh, this is uh, we're in a period of maybe the sixth mass extinction. Uh, hundreds of species are being wiped out every day. Uh, 
the uh, automation and cyber nation is creeping in uh, with the automatic factories. Uh, the, the workforce has been globalized down to $2 a day. Um, people are desperate all over the whole entire planet. Uh, they're recognizing some of this threat. That's why they are dashing into Europe, dashing into America, dashing into uh, development areas. Uh, even with a fascist takeover of uh, American politics, uh, the world seems to be on the edge of a mass rebellion. Um, how, how do you see the world responding to this? Well, that's why I see so much hope in this this movement of young people out, you know, out in the streets, and, and they're doing other things besides being out in the streets. Because I think many, many young people in this country and other places around the world realize that what we're facing is a collapsing system. The, the whole capitalist system uh, is collapsing um, and it's taking down the planet and us with it. So people are recognizing that we need to have an alternative to that. Um, we, we need to think of, of a future where the great productive capacities that we have that capitalism has built are, are used um, for the betterment of people. So we have education, healthcare, decent living, uh, significant opportunities for creative um, leisure time and so forth. We, we, we could have all this. Uh, and it's, it's great that the term socialism has now been introduced to our political vocabulary. And we, you know, we have to thank Bernie scientists for making that, at least the term socialism. I, what he means by socialism is not going, in my opinion, going far enough, but at least that's part of the, of the political conversation. And um, assuming that Biden does get elected uh, at that point, um, we have to be very clear I mean, that uh, we can't just go on the way we're going, that we have, to, we have to rethink the whole structure of our economic relationships. That's something we can't describe in two minutes, but that's what we have to do. I'm 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 gonna end this conversation. I I I think that we probably need to have another conversation sometime later on, maybe uh, right after the election. Good. Uh, good. Uh, that would that'd be great. Yeah, I think it would probably be good. Uh, so thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Eddie, and thank you for everything that you're doing. You're a hero. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.